In 509 BC, the Romans rebelled against the harsh rule of the Etrusian king Tarquinus, Superbus the Proud. What a name, that is an excellent name, and declared an independent republic. This blow was followed by the crippling defeat of the Etrusian fleet by the Syracusans of Cumae in 474 BC, and the fall of northern Etruria to the Celts, whom the Romans called Gauls. The rising power of Rome was gradually encroaching on Etruria, and the Etrusians lost faith to the Romans about 396 BC. Civil war followed between the Etrusian civil states when some of them allied themselves with the Roman commander Marius against his rival Sulla. When Sulla came to power in Rome in 86 BC, he swept away the last remnants of Etrusian independence and incorporated the city-states into the territory of Rome. And I think that's all we get on the Etrusians, so a bright blip in the history of civilizations as we now move on to the Celts. And the beautiful bronze work of the Celts has been found in every corner of Europe, a testimonial to the extent of destruction wrought by this warrior race. Their priests, druids, performed mysterious rites at temples such as Stonehenge. So the freebooting Celts, who were of unknown origin, began to migrate from Central Europe about 500 BC to found settlements in modern now France, Belgium, and Ireland. They lived in large family groups and farmsteads which they defended with stockades, and these farmsteads stood within reach of hill forts to which all the families in an area would flee if attacked. They practiced mixed farming, especially cereal growing and cattle raising. Although men normally wore belted tunics, Celtic horse riders introduced trousers into Europe about 300 BC. So it was in the 500s that the Mediterranean traders first came into contact with the barbarous Celts, an Indo-Aryan people, then centred in Switzerland and present-day southwestern Germany. They then spread from Central Europe, some to plunder European trade routes, others to establish a settled civilization in present-day France, Belgium, Britain and Ireland. So below the kings, Celtic society had an upper class of warriors, the highest rank of which were priests, called druids, and a lower caste of free farmers. The large family groups of Celts lived together in stockaded farmsteads, usually within reach of a fortified hill, to which the whole community could flee if attacked. Women wore long single-piece gowns, and their status varied between settlements. Men usually wore tunics or shirts, and both sexes wore cloaks as overgarments. Trousers were introduced into Western Europe by the Celts. So if you're rocking a, rocking a pair of pantalons right now, you can thank the Celts for it. The Celts who had learned metalworking from nomadic tribes further east became outstanding craftsmen, and bronze work of superb quality dating from the 600 BCs has been found at Stretveg in Austria. Later, Celtic chiefs from Central Europe traded the masterpieces of their bronze myths for Greek wine-drinking vessels of bronze and pottery. Hallstatt in Austria became the centre of Celtic ironworking, and from there the craft spread in westwards. Celtic art also spread from its centre in Switzerland. Among the many deities of Celtic Ireland was the Dagda, father of all, and the lord of life and death. The Dagda was an ugly, pot-bellied figure mounted on wheels who carried a monstrous club. With one end of the club he could kill nine men, and with the other end he could restore them all to life. A little bit like those videos you see on social media of um, ice cream vendors giving you ice cream, taking it away, giving you the go, taking it away, but with your life. So, um, a little bit more stressful. Another god, Lug, a multi-skilled craftsman, was worshipped throughout the Celtic world, and Welsh deities included the children of Don, one of whom, Kovanan, was a smith and brewer. The Druids performed secret religious and magical rites in which noon, midnight, the full moon, the oak, and its parasite, the mistletoe, played sacred roles. I didn't know the mistletoe was a parasite of the oak. About 400 BC, Germanic tribes began squeezing the Celts out of Germany, and many of them were absorbed into the various tribes then in movement across Europe. Some mounted on horseback and armed with iron weapons set off to find new territory in present-day Italy, Spain and France, and crossed into Britain and Ireland. In 390 BC, the Celts invaded Etruria, sacked Rome, and plundered southwards as far as Sicily. The Romans called them Gauls, and to northern Etruria, where some of the Celts settled, they gave the name 
This is Alpine Gaul. Gauls this side of the Alps. The Gauls continued their ravages in 335 BC. They faced Alexander the Great in Macedonia. About 279 BC they had moved as far as Delphi, where they desecrated the sacred oracle. They then crossed into Asia Minor, where they became known as the Galatians, and were finally quelled by King Atlas of Pergamum. Seemingly acting like British people on holiday. I'm only joking, that's not representative of all British peoples, but uh, it's an unfortunate stereotype, isn't it? Rome strikes back. By 192 BC, the Roman army had grown in strength and marched through the old Etruscan territories to conquer the Cisalpine Gaul. Then they crossed the Alps into Transalpine Gaul, which extended from the Pyrenees beyond modern Belgium and was inhabited by three peoples, Aquitani, Belgae, and Celtae, all of whom the Romans called the Gauls. Despite the hundreds, uh, during the 100 BCs, the Romans took the Mediterranean coastal strip of Gaul, which they named Provincia, and Julius Caesar annexed the rest of Gaul in 58-49 BC. Before this, about 75 BC, the Belgae had invaded Britain, where earlier Celtic migrants had established Iron Age settlements. Unaware of cross-channel aid between the Belgae, Julius Caesar landed briefly in Britain in 55 BC, returning a year later. Probably didn't enjoy the weather. Uh, well, we're obviously getting quite quickly into these little brief bits about these uh, civilizations, so we now move on to the Macedonians. The short life of the boy king Alexander the Great is a dramatic adventure. At its height, his empire was the largest known to the ancient world, covering over 5 million square kilometers. Huge. So the Macedonian Empire, begun by King Philip II of Macedon, was expanded by his son Alexander into the biggest empire that the world had ever seen at that point. They absorbed the Persian Empire and extended it into Libya, the Balkans, Central Asia and India. And Alexander, a fervent internationalist, forced his officers to marry foreign wives. This onyx cameo shows the heads of Alexander and Roxanne, his Persian princess wife. Rivals murdered Roxanne and her son after Alexander's death. That is not pleasant. So bordering the northwestern corner of the Aegean Sea was the mountainous semi-Greek kingdom of Macedon, and the orator Demosthenes, who died in 322 BC, represented the general Greek view of the Macedonians when he described them as useless barbarians, unable to shine even as slaves. He jibed that feudy nobles kept Macedon weak, but all this changed when Philip II became king of Macedon in 359 BC. So Philip was a great general, and an accomplished politician who roused Macedonian nationalism by pursuing an aggressive foreign policy. Sure of their superiority, the Greeks did not take Philip's challenge seriously, and this gave him time to hammer his recruits into a disciplined infantry. In 342 BC, Philip conquered Thrace, so Athens and Thebes hastily formed an alliance to protect themselves, but Philip routed their armies at the Battle of Geronia in 338 BC. Instead of punishing the defeated Greeks, Philip forced them into an alliance called the League of Corinth, which he controlled. Then, with the League's support, he prepared the invasion of Persia in 336 BC. But before this took place, Philip was murdered by one of his own bodyguards. Despite court intrigues, the succession passed to Philip's power-hungry son, Alexander, who speedily put down risings in Thrace, Illyria, and Thebes. So here the Macedonian phalanx soldiers kept enemies at bay by using their very long thrusting spears which allowed the cavalry to charge at a weak spot in the enemy line, so breaking the ranks. The Macedonian soldier disciplined in the new tactics of Philip and Macedon proved superior to the soldiers of Greek states to the south. Under Alexander the Macedonian army humbled the mighty Persian one. In this mosaic from Pompeii shows Darius and his Persian army in full battle. Alexander routed the Persians at Issus, and Darius fled. So Alexander the Great was soon to develop the greatest empire known to the ancient world. His campaigns began when in 334 BC he um, crossed the Hellespont on the Bosphorus with 32,000 infantry and 5,000 cavalry troops. The Persian force was quickly defeated, and Alexander then marched across Asia Minor. Although the Persian king Darius III took Alexander by surprise, he was decisively beaten, and Persia began to collapse quicker than Alexander could advance. Having taken Syria and Phoenicia, Alexander entered Egypt to be acclaimed as a god, and in 331 BC he defeated Darius at Galgamela, then pressed on to take the Persian capitals of Babylon, Susa, Persepolis, and Nagabadana. 
Alexander then turned explorer. He enticed his armies on to remote Parthia, Bactria, Sogdiana, and the Punjab. Possibly he would have gone on to China, but his weary troops forced him to follow the Indus River south to Patala, near the Indian Ocean. There his army divided. Part of it put to sea and sailed up the Persian Gulf, while the main body, led by its king, made the dreary march back to Persia. The two forces linked near Susa, Babylon, where in 323 BC, worn out perhaps by his effort, Alexander died of fever at the age of 33. The Macedonian Empire, the largest then known, was left leaderless. Alexander's death brought an immediate struggle for power between his generals and relatives, and half a century of foreign and civil wars followed. One general, General Ptolemy, resorted to stealing the general's corpse with the hope that the legend of Alexander would help make him master of Egypt. However, most of the Indian conquests were lost to Chandragupta I and the Mauryas, and Macedon and Greece slipped into anarchy, while Babylonia fell to Seleucus I. The rise and fall of Macedon had been so swift that it almost had no culture to spread abroad, although the Macedonian generals did carry aspects of Greek civilization into the lands they conquered. Here's a Ptolemaic queen wearing the headdress of the vulture goddess Mut. This was the royal exemplar of all Egyptian queens, down to Cleopatra the Seventh, the Cleopatra who committed suicide in 30 BC, and the statue found in Thebes is of Alexander the Great. It took Ptolemy 18 years to secure his position in Egypt and make himself pharaoh, although he reigned in 304-282 BC and his dynasty was to last 274 years. Ptolemy founded only one new city, Ptolemais, so avoided the danger of independent city-states emerging. Everything in Egypt was methodically governed and taxed by an army of Greco-Macedonian officials, and as a result, the Ptolemies became the richest of Alexander's heirs. Much of their wealth was lavished on Alexandria, their capital, and this island of Greek culture became, for several centuries, the leading city of the West after Rome. The Ptolemies patronized Greek scientists and scholarship in Alexandria when they founded a museum for the study of the Muses, nine goddesses of the arts. They also built up two vast libraries which together held about 500,000 different rolls of papyrus books. A university was founded with several leading scholars in attendance, and Herophilus, a physician, founded a medical school. But outside Alexandria, Ptolemies and Nacrautis, a trading centre, Egypt continued largely as before. It had merely replaced its Egyptian, Assyrian and Persian pharaohs for Macedonian ones. Seleucus was the founder of a dynasty that lasted 237 years. A less prominent general than Ptolemy, he nevertheless gained the biggest share of Alexander's empire, and more than any attempted to recreate the empire according to Alexander's ideals. Winning Babylon by 312 BC, he fought perpetual wars to extend his territory to the borders of Macedon and India. Seleucus continued the Persian system of government. He also founded several colonies that included Antioch on the Orontes River, his capital, which became second only to Alexandria. Seleucus was assassinated in 28 BC, just as he was about to seize the vacant throne of Macedon. And lastly, Pergamon, a Greek city-state, managed to break away from Seleucid control at a time of Seleucid weakness. It seized Western and Central Asia Minor. Pergamum's empire reached its height about the 190s BC, and Pergamum itself became a brilliant centre of Greek civilization. It avoided being attacked by the Macedonians and the Seleucids through its friendship with Rome, and when King Atlas III died in 133 BC, he bequeathed Pergamum to the Romans. By then, Macedon had already fallen to them. The Seleucid kingdom fell in 84 BC, Ptolemy King Egypt in AD 30. We move on to another giant civilization here, the glory that was Rome. This city was the jewel of Roman culture, and much still remains of the Romans' work in Italy and the rest of Europe, for they were skilled engineers and builders. Though for a thousand years they were nearly always at war. The huge, which reached its greatest um, extent under Trajan in AD 117. And of course, in legend, a she-wolf suckled Remus and his brother Romulus, the supposed founder of Rome in 753 BC. But the bronze stone was cast by Etruscans, who in fact founded the city about 600 BC. So the Romans established their independence from Etruria in 509 BC, but it took them 300 years to conquer Italy. They then spent another 300 years building up the empire to its greatest extent and under Emperor Trajan it covered about 6.5 million square kilometres in three continents and contained about 
perhaps 60 million people. From this peak it declined for nearly 400 years. These thousand years of Rome were spent in almost perpetual warfare, and after the city of Rome fell the barbarians, the empire had another thousand years of life in the east. This later Roman Empire, founded upon Byzantium, modern Istanbul, ended little more than 500 years ago in 1453. Western Rome was a republic for the first half of its life, and an empire for the second. Julius Caesar and his successor, Augustus, marked the transition at a time when the new religion of Christianity was emerging. From then, the affairs of empire and church were to become closely interdependent. While Roman culture borrowed heavily from Greek, the Romans were a much more practical people, excelling in government and engineering. The Macedonians took the Greek civilization eastwards. But the Romans spread it in modified form throughout Western Europe and the Mediterranean. So in the early days of the Republic, citizens were divided into upper-class patricians and lower-class plebeians. For 200 years, tribunes, spokesmen of the plebeians, demanded an equal share in government, and in 287 BC, the plebeians at last won the right to become senators and consuls. But in practice, this was barely possible, because as politicians were unpaid, no plebeians could afford to take on the job, and senators and consuls continued to be mostly rich landowners. Yes, isn't that always the case of democratizing things? It's well, well and good being able to access the corridors of power, but if that requires you to not actually have an income to feed yourself, it's very difficult. As the empire expanded, the Romans built a vast network of roads to travel along safely and quickly. And where possible, they took the direct line between towns, sometimes opening up dense forests as seen below. The roads were leveled and had foundations of sand mixed with gravel or lime and were surfaced with stone slabs and they were sometimes cambered and had drainage ditches on either side. So perpetual wars made the rich richer and the poor poorer. Landowners ceased to hire free men when they could use prisoners of war for nothing and poverty-stricken out-of-work peasants either crowded into the city of Rome looking for jobs or emigrated. When in 133 BC the popular tribune Tiberius Gracchus demanded that land should be seized and given to the landless poor, he was murdered. Rome then began 100 years of riots, rebellions and civil wars, during which time the strongest men ruled. Marius and Sulla were followed by other military dictators, and in 54 BC Julius Caesar seized Rome to control the whole Roman world. Caesar was murdered because the Romans feared that he would make himself the, their emperor by ironically his death in 44 BC marked the beginning of the reign of about 80 emperors. The first, Augustus, was appointed by the Senate in 29 BC. Roman politics were alive with intrigue, and an emperor needed either a great deal of wisdom or a great deal of cunning and an efficient network of spies to stay in power for long. Often their lives came to a violent end at the hands of their enemies whether by poison or a dagger, and one of the most nerve-wracking jobs in the court must have been that of official food taster to the emperor in all years. Among those who ruled the Romans well was Claudius, a gentle and wise man, and a strong emperor despite the fact that he stammered and was lame. At the other end of the scale were the reigns of cruelty and terror of Caligula and Nero, who murdered both his mother and his wife and began the persecution of the Christians. Over five centuries, Rome changed from Etruscan border town to the capital of the West, and Octavian, or Augustus as he was more commonly known, claimed that he had turned a city of brick into one of marble. No doubt, though, he was thinking of the luxurious villas and ornamental gardens of the wealthy, rather than the squalid slum, slums that sheltered the poor. Rome's unemployment situation was desperate. Those who could not get work often mobbed together to protest. The most likely area of employment lay in building the new Rome as more and more temples, public baths, government buildings and private houses rose skywards. Allied with the building trade was the transportation of stone and marble into Rome, which became a major industry. The vast Colosseum took over 200,000 tons of stone for facing alone, and as Rome expanded to house a million people, it outgrew its port of Ostia, and Claudius enlarged it, building a new harbour and extensive warehouses. Although the Romans alone as uh, shone as engineers, they had little interest in science. Perhaps medicine was of interest, but much of their technology was a byproduct of militarism, like their roads and bridges, which were built by the conquering Roman army, and their aqueducts, which carried water into garrison towns. Ingenious battering ram 
walls and slings were built to attack enemy cities and solid fortifications to defend their own. And although the Romans devised such machines as water-powered mills using gears, they were not shy of cruelty and mainly used the labour of slaves. These slaves made it possible to keep up to 750,000 men in arms and maintain a small ruling class living in luxury. Roman sculpture lacked at the little lithe movement of the Greek and Indian, and their massive architecture was impressive rather than beautiful. Their magnificent amphitheatres were used mainly for martial sports, as befitted a war-centred civilization, and not for drama. Although the Romans produced some fine dramatists, along whom were Livisius, Aeneas, and Plautus, they likewise used Greek inspiration for their themes. The Romans had an even finer array of poets, including Ovid, Virgil, Lucretius, and Horace. And other outstanding writers were historians such as Livy, Suetonius, Sanctacitus, Pliny the Elder, and his nephew and the master of Roman prose, Cicero. In the marketplaces, fortune tellers, jugglers, conjurers, and musicians competed for the approval of the crown. But circuses were most popular entertainment of all, and everyone from the emperor down went to watch horse and chariot racing, wrestling, and games. So the Romans did not achieve any important advances in agricultural techniques, but they kept the usual animals and their products and for transport, cultivated wheat, barley, uh, vegetables, olives, papyrus and flax. So for most things the Roman Empire was self-sufficient, formed its own common market with private trade craftsmen supplying local needs. The most important external trade, which was government controlled, was in slaves, who came from the Germanic lands to the north and from the old Persian Empire. And silk and spices were imported from China, incense from Yemen, and pepper from India. Trading with other countries was a lengthy business, as land transport was slow and seafaring risky, so inland waterways were always used where possible. The Roman emperors were continuously issuing new edicts. A great body of law existed, but uh, clever lawyers were nevertheless often able to baffle less knowledgeable judges, because the law was never codified until after Rome had collapsed in the West, when the job was undertaken by Justinian. The first deities of Rome were nature spirits, especially of woods, waterways and wells, but the Romans later adopted new gods from Greece, from Egypt, Isis and Osiris, and from Persia, Mithras. Religion of all kinds was tolerated by the state, as was witchcraft, as long as it didn't challenge authority. The Christians, however, had a checkered history of persecution and tolerance under the Romans. At the time of the crucifixion of Jesus on Nazareth, Nazareth in AD 30, they were insignificant in numbers, but rapidly grew as Paul spread his teachings to Asia Minor, Greece and Italy. They first made themselves felt as a group in Rome at the time of Claudius, who complained in AD 49 that their gatherings caused uproars. But they were not persecuted until Nero unjustly accused them of setting fire to Rome in AD 64. So for the next 300 years the Christians were mostly left in peace until the reign of Diocletian. But four years after his death, Galerius and Constantine I restored their freedom of worship. As conditions improved, so the number of converts rose until Theodosius I made Christianity the official religion in the hope of unifying his people. Here are some techniques a Roman recruit equipped with wooden sword and wicker work shield practices his drill. He attacks the post as an enemy and learns to thrust. Here's a Roman broadsword with a decorated scabbard found in Germany. The Roman army a citizen militia was raised when needed by recruiting men of property or money aged 17 to 60, and each legion had some 5,000 infantry men and 300 cavalry. Though through safe country, a legion marched in a long column, headed by a vanguard of auxiliary troops, then took the brunt of any surprise attacks, sparing the crack troops. So a band picked body of equites, cavalry, and heavily armoured pikemen with long shields came next, forming an escort for the fort legion or army commanders. Following the elite troops came the pioneer corps and the surveyors. They carried the tools for felling trees, clearing route and pitching camp. The legion commander, usually a senator, had a senior tribune as an assistant. Third in the chain of command came the camp prefect, picked the infantrymen, guarded them. And following the commanders came the aquifier, bearer of the eagle top standard, wearing an animal skin. Other bearers carried standards for each century. And the baggage train, comprising of mules and ox carts, carried the army supplies. The main infantry column, armed with shields, pikes, broadswords, and daggers, marched six abreast and carried their personal equipment wedged in wooden forks. So legend has it that Romulus, the son of Mars, founded Rome in 753 BC, but in fact it was probably founded by the Etrusians about 600 BC. 
After its independence in 509 BC, Rome had to fight for survival against neighboring tribes, and in 390 BC drove off an attack by the Gauls, and then another from the nearby Sanites and Greeks of the south. Having built up and tested its military strength and forced off its attackers, Rome then went in to attack itself. It took the granary of Sicily from Carthage in the First Punic War, later adding Sardinia and Corsica to its conquests. The Carthaginian victory over Spain heralded the beginning of the Second Punic War, when the Carthaginian commander Hannibal was followed by his brother Hasdrubal across the Pyrenees and the Alps to invade Italy. But the Romans outwitted the Carthaginians by daringly counter-attacking Africa and Spain, which they conquered. In the Third Punic War, Rome renewed its attack on Africa and cruelly raised Carthage to the ground. Meanwhile, the Romans were gaining firm footholds in other parts of the world. When the Greeks appeared to Rome to free them from Macedonian rule, its troops intervened and eventually annexed all Macedonia. And 133 BC saw the addition of Pergamon to the Empire, which gave the Romans a stronghold in Asia. Julius Caesar conquered Gaul. Egypt was annexed by Octavian, who became, began 200 years of Pax Romana. And in AD 43, Claudius annexed Britain. Interestingly enough, the Romans neglected easier conquests closer to home, and it wasn't until 87 BC that they had most of Italy under their control. The empire reached its height under Trajan in AD 117, when it occupied a vast rectangle of land networked with Roman roads with its four corners in Britain, the Caspian Sea, Egypt, and Spain. Most of this territory was still held when Theodosius died in 395, but by then Rome's power was declining fast. In 395, the Roman Empire was divided by agreement into the West and East. The Western Empire was internally weak, and its borderlands were soon invaded by attackers who were pushed further into the more prosperous Eastern Empire by stronger Asian nomads. The Empire fell as its strongholds and treasures were relinquished to looters. Rome was looted by the Visigoths under Alaric in 410, and finally sacked by Vandals in 455. Attila's Huns invaded Italy in 452, but were driven back from the Po River by famine and disease. Other attackers were more successful, and include the Angles, Saxons, Jutes, Franks, Burgundians, and uh, Ostrogoths. The onslaught culminated in 476 with the deposition of the last Western Roman Emperor by the German chief, Odesia. So here is Pompeii, a Greek city in Italy that came under Roman rule, destroyed by the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. Very famous town, of course. And this is an artist's reconstruction of a villa in Pompeii, showing a noble's house richly decorated with frescoes, marble columns, and mosaics. The ground and first floors on the left are shops rendered out um, by the owner, and in the centre is the main living room or atrium, with a hole in the ceiling and a pool in the middle. Bedrooms lead off it, and to the right of the atrium is a tablinium or reception room. The colonnaded area is an open courtyard containing the family shrine, and below this is a uh, kitchen and a dining room. And here is a wealthy Roman's country estate, generally self-supporting, as well as the main villa. There were workshops, barns and granaries, a kitchen garden, and beyond the wall are cornfields, vineyards and olive groves. And with that, the conclusion of the Roman Empire, I think we better pin in it for there. We're over halfway through this book now enjoying it very much. I hope you are too. So I look forward to seeing you next time. Until then.